Welcome to the Story Powers Podcast, a show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, keynote speaker and storytelling coach, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Ted Frank. In decades of working in corporations, he got tired of seeing great ideas go to waste and people losing their sense of purpose because they couldn't present successfully. Now, Ted runs his own strategic story consulting firm, teaching people movie storytelling techniques to get to the heart of their audiences. The company he works with make cars like Porsche and Fiat Chrysler, they make toilet paper like Georgia Pacific, and they make shows about cars and toilet paper like Netflix. I've already learned a lot from him, but I must admit that his book made me a little nervous when he filled many of the first pages with detailed instructions on how to put together an elite baby-killing squad. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Frank. Ted, welcome to the show. Oh, it is so good to see you. So good to, <laughs> and I say see you because normally when I do these podcasts, I can't see the person. And it was like being behind the curtain and seeing all the magic. <laughs> Now that you, you've, you've already started us with a, with a movie reference, I wanted to ask, what is this rumor I hear that your last name has a relation to Frankenstein? Actually, that is, that is my proper last name, or it was my, my grandparents' proper last name. And I think what happened was like right around the time when the movie came out, in about the 30s, they were probably getting too much flack. And they went to the courthouse and they shortened it down to Frank. And then funny thing was that when I got married the first time, I decided to take my ex-wife's last name. And my father was not happy about that. So, you know, he confronted me on it. And I said, you know, you guys changed your last name, you know, and it all worked out. And uh, that shut him up good. I'm not sure it's quite the same thing, but, <laughs> but fair enough. One of the things that that I wanted to to get out right at the beginning is... Because a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is why presentations suck and how you approach making them better. So before I give my take on, on that, why do you think presentations suck? Well, I think presentations suck probably for a lot of the same reasons you, you, that you feel as well, which is that you're asking way too much of the audience and way too much, let's say, in, in my world, is, which is the corporate world, of the executives and the senior managers that are coming in this room. They have probably had already six or seven meetings that day. They've watched chart after chart after chart, probably hundreds, maybe even a thousand charts that day. And to go subject them to more charts and more text heavy slides and more really hard work for their brains and their eyes to go through is just too much for them. And it's it's you know it's no wonder that they all zone out on their phones or they, you know, leave the room not remembering a lot of the time. Yeah, it's interesting because that that approach is one that uh, I think you reference that uh, expression or that book title of drinking from the fire hose. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this idea of just being overwhelmed and drowning in information is, is clearly one of the typical problems that people come across with, with presentations, particularly the more technical type of presentations. I come across a different, I and mean, I come across that problem, but I come across a different type of problem as well, which is this idea that every presentation needs to be backed up by a slide deck, which for now on we'll call PowerPoint for simplicity, because everyone recognizes that more easily than slide deck. And they think that they need to have slides. They don't necessarily know what the slides need to be. It's not a whole bunch of technical information that probably they have to present some, some way or another. And then what you end up getting is either the classic headline with bullet points, or you get even when you get images, it becomes this thing of, I cannot say anything that is not backed up by a slide. Because I think I can forgive more easily a technical presentation that has graphs than a sales presentation that has the exact words you're saying on the screen. Or you say, when we look at millennials, picture of millennials. When we talk to boomers, picture of boomers. It's okay. People can hear what you're saying. They don't need to to see everything, uh, particularly when it's not adding. And then in my world, what tends to happen is just people become, it becomes a crutch, people read it, and whatever presentation skills they had to begin with go down the drain. I tend to go down this extreme route that most people shouldn't have any PowerPoint. 
And I don't want to defend that. That's not what I want to talk to you about. But I just wanted a quick take from you on why you think that in the vast majority of cases of the people you work with, that's not really an alternative. You know, I, I in the corporate world, it is definitely expected and it's kind of the default, but you're absolutely right. It's definitely not necessary. And when you can do it without PowerPoint, you should absolutely do it. And I'll give you a perfect example for that in a minute. But first, I kind of wanted to hit on one of the things that you brought up that, and why it's so awful. You know, you talked about putting text on the slide and putting a lot of text on the slide. And, and you said reading the slide. When people do that, it really does them a disservice because if you're the executive sitting watching that presentation, your eyes can read that across the screen far quicker than the person can say it. So when the person says it and they're reading it, unless they read it really, really fast, that executive's eyes and ears are out of sync. And that require, then requires their brain to have to put it all together. And it's more work. Um, the reason why you know, we might do things like show a millennial when we, have, when we say a millennial is that it puts everybody on the exact same page and we now have a visual reference for who that millennial is. And especially if you're going to bring people back to that millennial and that millennial becomes a hero, let's say, in the, the presentation, it really helps, you know, because in corporate culture, people have hundreds and thousands of things to think about all the time, especially if you're an executive. Making it as easy as possible is so helpful for them. Well, I spoke to another speaker called James Taylor. He was one of the first episodes on the podcast and a friend and someone I work with. And he believes the visuals are what people remember. I disagree. I think it's the story that people remember. So my my view is that if you're comparing someone up there doing a story-based presentation with no PowerPoint, with someone doing the, a reasonably competent presentation and, and a whole bunch of visuals on the PowerPoint, but not necessarily connected to the story, not the stuff you do. So let's call it, let's say it a competent, regular type of PowerPoint presentation. I think that the story-based presentation with no deck is going to beat that hands down every time you do it well. What I don't know is if a story-based visual presentation would al always beat the story-based presentation with no deck. Well, that totally depends, I think, on the person either telling the story or the person presenting it. If you're a skilled storyteller like yourself or Garrison Keillor or you know any of the people who do it really really well, yes, you you can visually you can evoke visuals in people's brains. They don't need anything else, and their voice your voice is just amazing. Like you know when I I listen to a podcast called This American Life with Iyer Glass, that is one of the most captivating podcasts ever. But not everybody's got those skills. And you know you know from you know making this your life's work how much talent and how much work went into it and how much discipline you have to have when you tell a story. And I've found that that's often asking a lot of the average person. So, you know, we sometimes they need that crutch. And if that crutch can make it just make them more compelling and can make it easier on the person who's watching it, probably it's good enough. But I kind of also want to hit another point, which is that there's storytelling, but the most powerful thing you can do is what I call story staging. And that's where you make your whoever's watching the actual hero of the story and they experience everything. And that is even more powerful than any of the other things. And I, I want to get into that, but let me let me just ease us into it uh, and as a, from a slightly different way. We've agreed that most presentations suck. Uh, and, and you came across this in your previous work where a lot of great ideas never were followed through, never got developed because when it came to selling those concepts, people couldn't do it well. So you you started figuring out that storytelling might be the answer. And one thing I don't think we need to do is bang on about why storytelling is the answer, because in, anyone listening to this podcast probably has heard that from me a million times. But you said something in your book, which I wanted to pick you up on. He's, you said, when people try to do storytelling, it's either too difficult or often it's too difficult or hokey. So I just wanted you to, to explain why, you, you know, just give me an example of what you mean by either the too difficult or the, or the hokey type of storytelling. Yeah, well, the too difficult is kind of like, you know, what, what I just um, hit on before. But the too hokey is when people add, a, let's say, a hero to the story that seems like it's artificial. Like they, they start their presentation with, meet Francisco, <laughs> a, you know. He's a podcast, you know, he's a podcast journalist 
and a story a storyteller in Barcelona. And then they give you like 30 seconds of Francisco and none of that is really important. So then, you know, then they keep really force fitting story elements into something that could be a whole lot more simple and could just come down to here's what's going on. Here's what here's why it matters. And here is what needs to be done about it. I guess that has a little to do with something that a lot of people do when they're trying to tell stories is that they will pick some of the elements, but not actually tell a story. So it happens in both ways. You see some people say, uh, you get this on social media a lot, story time. And then they say, oh, you know, when I went to university, I, I, I didn't have that many friends and, and I decided to dedicate myself to whatever. Uh, and it, it was really important to me. That's not a story. Like to just give me a statement about you know how university was. There's not nothing is. To you pick a phrase from your book, uh, it's not you know something's happening to somebody somewhere. It's just like this is what university was like. That's not a story. So that's one problem. And the other problem is people who say you know meet Francisco and you give some of my character traits, and and you say Francisco likes to do this. Francisco likes to do that. It's not a story. So it backfires because you're trying to do something which is kind of artificial and you do it very badly. So it's the worst of both worlds in a way. Yeah, I think you just answered better than I did. So well done. Thank you. I, I, it's, this is one thing I always I always say to people. The job of anyone who calls themselves a speaker is sound confident and, and sound like we know what we're talking about when we speak about stuff. It doesn't mean we know it any better than anyone else. We just put it together in a way that hopefully sounds convincing. I must admit, I was surprised um, with you know both the people we work with and some of the, the one of the major examples in the book at the very end is Netflix. So it's a it's a it's a very interesting story about uh, a consumer insight presentation that you know, Netflix highlighting how most consumers, at least at the time, weren't very aware of Netflix originals. I think now that that would have changed significantly by now, but then it was a big, potentially a big issue for them. And what I was very surprised about was that, you know, I, I teach people storytelling. I would think that Netflix is the last company I would ever bother pitching because surely these guys know what they're doing when it comes to telling stories. And I would have expected that it permeated more to other parts of the company and not just, you know, the creatives that are actually involved with the content. Based on what I've, what the impression I got from your book, that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, I definitely think it's much more the case than, than other companies. It definitely has permeated, but it's a long, long road from, you know, someone who's, let's say, you know, a researcher or a data analyst or a programmer up to that create to that director level that they are in the creative on the creative team. You know, at, at Netflix, one of the reasons why I love them so much is that the standard for presentations is so much higher there than it is anywhere else. And every single presentation has to almost be a movie in order to make sure that that it's compelling. And, and one of the things we do is we have put a lot of video in all of our presentations so that we can really show and we can really bring a fourth emotion and things that I just don't get to do in other, you know, with other clients. But um, it is still a long road. That's why I say, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask of people to be good storytellers because it's a whole skill set that they just don't have yet. I need to meet people at their desk in my world and really help them, you know, do what they can do within that month that they've got to do it. Yeah, one thing that I, I found very interesting throughout the book is comparing your approach to most of what my approach is and the approach of people like uh, Anecdote, which are a story-based consultant as well. Whereas the things I resonate more naturally with are so simple that the idea of of that people are not necessarily good storytellers and, and, and how much of a craft it is becomes a lot less relevant because often, all, all, and again, it's not going to be appropriate to every presentation, but often all you need to do is say, okay, you, you're now presenting to the team, the company is going through a transition period, and you now need to convince them that you are the person to lead that transition. All you need to do now is think of a moment in your life where you've gone through an experience that was similar, personally, idea, not even professionally. Either, and either you got it right then, 
or you got it completely wrong and realize that um, you need to dedicate yourself to becoming better at it. And people will typically be able to think of, of an experience that they had that was that. And then the presentation mostly becomes you go in, you tell that story, and then you move on to, to the action points of what they have to do. And that, I would argue, anyone can do. And they might not be able to deliver it terribly well. And you know, the way I deliver it when I practice with them is one way. The way they deliver it again on stage is different. But yeah, it's, it's a world apart from, from some of the higher end stuff you do. And, and just so it's clear to everyone who's listening, I wanted to talk about what you just called story staging, um, which I think is what I'm thinking of. The type of stuff you do to open presentations. And I don't know if that's what you mean by story staging. Well, that's um, that definitely is story staging, but um, you can actually make the entire thing story or your entire presentation a story stage. Okay. I uh, and actually to, to answer your first part, first point, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that everybody can tell stories. It's just whether or not you know they have that time to put into it to get there. And I think that there are certain people that are naturally wonderful, you know, orators, and that for them that that verbal approach is perfect. And then there are people, you know, like me who are very visual and the movie approach where, you know, you're, you're taking people right to the scene works really well. And so it's really, you know, what works best for, every, for anybody and what um, the people that they're talking to will most, you know, will most gravitate toward and what will make an impression on them. So I'll give you an ex- a story about story staging. I, I did a project for a cable company and they had a lot of these set top boxes that they were doing like kind of like DVRs. And their DVR on the, you know, they had the, the, the standard one, then they had better ones and better ones. And the executives all had the best one, but the majority of their subscribers had the one, had the, had the entry level one that wasn't nearly as good. And it wasn't nearly as good as the competitors. And the team that I was with was charged with convincing the executives that they needed to upgrade that box to get up to their competitors because they were losing. But they knew the executives all had the premium model. So they didn't have a problem and they couldn't, you know, no matter what they told the executives, the executives were always thinking about what's my experience at home. I don't know what these people are bitching about because it's fine. So what we did was we told the executives to not watch this really, this really big football game that we knew they all wanted to watch. Don't watch it. We're going to record it for you and you're going to get to see it, but don't watch it. So they came into that presentation really wanting to know what the score was and what what the game was. And when they walked in, we had three Lazy Boy chairs all set up in front of three televisions with three set-top boxes. One was ours, and two were the, the other competitors. And the three executives sat down, and we asked them, what we want you to do is we want you to fast forward to the first score in the game and then tell us what it is. And the competitors, the, the, guy, the executives who sat in front of the competitors, they got there very quickly. And the executives sitting in front of our set top box didn't. And the other two were, you know, they were, they were just clowning him and it was such a huge scene. And it was so demonstrative about why that our set top box was so far behind. And in the end, they got that story. It's one of those, it's a, it's a very good example of show don't tell. And there's another one you, you, you described that I, I thought was really, really interesting where you talked about um, turning off the lights Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you, often, if you want, you know, you, you need to suck people right into your story. And, you know, so having, like you said, a great opening when they walk in and like, you know, they walked in, they saw nothing but three lazy boys was that would tell them right away, this is not going to be like any other presentation. So all of the dread that they had that day just gets sucked out of their minds and they're, they can think about nothing else than the lazy boys. And turning off the lights is like the easiest way to get people to completely you know, refresh their minds because no one expects the lights to go down. And that's actually how I start one of my workshops is lights go off. Everyone's a little uncomfortable. They don't know why the lights are off. And then I launch in with the trailer for Moneyball, the movie with Brad Pitt, because that's all about data. Data is the hero of that story and about data's effect on sports. And it just, it just cleanses everything that was in their minds before and, and laser focuses them on what we're going to talk about that day. I think anyone that doubts the power of of story just needs to to look into Michael Lewis's career. 
The man can make anything exciting. I think when he wasn't happy enough to write the Moneyball story, which, as you said, is about you know baseball statistics, he he said, "No, this is too easy. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a harder one." And then he did one about traders, people trying to do, you know, I forgot what they call now, fast traders or um, people trading like instantaneously and trying to get fiber optics cables across the United States to gain you know a tenth of a second on a trade. And then he said, "No, that's too exciting." I'm going to do one on behavioral economics. And I think his last book was, one of his last books was on, was in Daniel Kahneman and um, uh, Amos Tversky, the guys who dis- basically discovered and founded behavioral economics. I really liked the, the two, I think you call them the big two questions, which are, what do they need to do? And once you know that, which you only know by empathizing with them, what are the three most important things they need to do? Uh, they need to know to do it right. I really like that approach. And how do you go from there to just the the, the concept of, of the three key scenes? I start with empathize with the people in that room. What are they going through? What do they need to do with the information you're giving them? And then help them out, give them what they need to do to succeed at that. That when once you really put yourself in the uh, in the shoes of the person you're speaking to, it's amazing how people's perception of the information that they have in their deck changes and for the most part gets cut by like 75% a lot of the time. Then they create they put together three po- they divide their slides into three piles. And I emulate Hollywood because Hollywood has three key scenes that every screenwriter starts with. Before they write the hundred and so scenes of their movie, they start with these key three scenes. There's the inciting incident, which is this, you know, I'm going to use Star Wars as the example. That's when Luke sees Leia in the hologram, because before that, he is just a whiny ass farm boy that is never getting out of Tatooine. But he sees the princess and he has to save her. And then scene number two is what we call the turning point or sometimes called the midpoint, but it's not necessarily in the middle of the movie. And that's when we re- understand that our hero believes in the theme of the movie. So in Star Wars, it's when Luke uses the force, because now we know that we are all in with him. He is taking the big risk. It really gives us an emotional lift for the movie and sets us up for scene number three, which is the climax, which of course is when the Death Star blows up. And what screenwriters do is they write those key three scenes first, and then they always know where their story's going. And whenever they have a key scene, that or a new scene, that scene's job is to drive toward the next key scene. So it re, when when we put that um, to people in, in their in terms of their hundred page deck, it really helps them understand. Okay, I can actually have a story with these three. Every other slides has has the job of moving me forward rather than what they used to have, which is just it's what I have and I'm going to tell it. What is the simplest way to explain to someone? How will you turn a, a sort of cold data-based PowerPoint deck into three key scenes? Because having seen what you're doing it through the book and some of the other videos, that's that's clear enough to me. But I think for someone listening, I think the concept of what is my key scene, what's my turning point, I think they might not have been seeing it as a story to begin with. So how do you find what's the important scenes in that story? Well, I think that, you know, how Hollywood does it and their turning point, their their um, climax, you don't really need to worry about at that stage. Just figure out what are the three most important things, you know, that your stakeholders need to know in order to do what they need to do right. That's the key. And later on, we kind of will be able to get them to where they can build a story arc around that. But in the beginning, when they're just choosing what are my big three, just really think about what's going to be most helpful. Okay, and, and just to make this more, even more direct, would it be fair to say that what they need to figure out are the three most important insights or the three most important bits of data? So, you know, what you want them to do is say, adopt this new uh, strategy. So what are the three most important things that they need to know to adopt that strategy? And would, would it be fair to say that, you know, one of them might be, this is the, the big problem. And then the other one might be the opportunity. And then the last one is the solution. Yeah, that's, that often is, is the story arc because um, it, to kind of where, you, where, we're, where we emulate Hollywood is that instead of having the insightful in, in, inciting incident, the turning point and the climax, one of the, the story arcs I've seen work really well is first establish urgency. 
you know, why do we care about this? Why are we in the room? Like you said, what is the problem or what is the big opportunity? And what is it that it makes, that makes it important right now? You know, is there time running out? Will it get, if, if it's an opportunity, you know, will somebody else grab it before us? Or if it's a problem, will it get worse? And so often you're, the first thing you have, the thing that's really important is why do we care about it right now? Then the second thing, like you said, is that what's the big payoff if we go this route, if we, you know, take, if, or from learning this information, what are they going to be able to, to achieve or do? And, you know, what's the reward they're going to get? And then confidence, I think, is the last thing that's really important, which is what are we going to do about it or what can be done about it? And, you know, what's my strategy? What are my next steps? So that the executives in that room have a sense of we have to do this. We want to do this. And these guys can do it. I have faith in these people. Here's your green light. Here's your budget. Go make us a ton of money. In talking about how to get to the, the three most important things they need to know to do it right, obviously we're talking about heavy editing, which is when the <laughs> the baby killing comes into play. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this is a very common saying in Hollywood is that you have to kill your babies. It means you have to get rid of some of the things you, you like or that you, f you favor in, in a script or in whatever you working with to end up with the stuff that is really essential and good to to the movie or to the presentation but i really liked one technique that you described from um from david um, mamet mm -hmm. david mamet yeah mamet yeah uh, can you just describe what exactly he how he decides if a scene should stay or go yeah and i think everybody you can apply this to their slides as well as he goes through his 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 scenes and If anybody's seen a screenwriter, what they work, what they do is they usually write their scenes on index cards and they either put them on the wall or they put them on the table. So they have, it's just like a PowerPoint slide when you're looking at the slide sorter view, it's that rectangle. And he goes through every single one and he looks at the scene before it and he looks at the scene after it. And he asks himself, can I get from the scene before it to the scene after it without this scene? And if he can, it goes in the garbage. And if he can't, then it stays. But he puts him, he puts that he does that exercise with every scene so he can get rid of any scenes that really don't matter. And you can do the same thing with your deck. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you think about it, but no one does it this way. Is this idea of saying something and then backing that up, which is what most people do with the slides, you know, big headline, and then here's the bullet points that substantiate it, and your idea of flipping that. And, and again, that's very normal when you're speaking. If you're doing it, if you're half decent at speaking, you are always going to do it the way you do it. Um, so can you just explain how that, what that is and how that looks when it, when it comes to slides? Yeah, it, it's all, I think it's all started from the way the template is set up in PowerPoint, where you've got the, the big headline and then you've got your first level bullets and your second level bullets and your third level bullets. So you naturally do it that way. You naturally, like you said, put the big thing that's really important in the headline, and then you back it up with bullet one, bullet number two, bullet number three, bullet number four, and blah, 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 blah. And all of that just creates this downward slide in engagement for the people watching it because you've already given this big thing away. And then they just fall asleep and fall asleep and fall asleep even more because they don't need to pay attention. So it, great storytellers like yourself do and what movies do is they flip it. And what were bullet points that were supporting it, they now lay out as kind of clues that lead you toward the big point. And one of the examples that I bring up is how newspapers, which are a lot like corporations and, and, and PowerPoint templates, do it because you've got the headline and every, you know, every journalist has, you know, is taught, you got to give the meat in the headline and then you, you have your story to back it up. I give an example of this one article called Sharks Ch Kill Two in Australia. And we've got the, the, the article that flips or that backs it up. And the way I contrast that with the movie Jaws and how movies do it, which is that first thing you see is you see the swimmer and you don't even know there's a shark going on. Whereas before you knew that sharks, that the sharks killed two people. Now you just see the swimmer and then you see the outline of the shark. And then that's clues number one and clue number two. Then you see the fin pop out of the water. And even though you know exactly what's going to happen, you still have to pay attention because you, you just have to. And then at the end, that's when you get the bite. It's never in the beginning because they know 
we're going to lose interest. So as soon as the bite happens and you see some blood in the water, they're off to another scene because they know, like you, like you know, you've got to build up that tension, tension, anticipation, anticipation, big moment, and then do it again. But don't do it in the reverse. Yeah, I find interesting what works and what doesn't work for different types of storytelling. So the resource or technique that people use a lot in movies and books called uh, in media res, where you start in the middle of the action, that works very well in movies, that works very well in books. I don't find that it works terribly well in oral storytelling. It's difficult for me to say to you, my girlfriend and her parents are visiting, caught me with, you know, my trousers down with my crotch inside the freezer. But what happened that day was, it just doesn't really work. It just feels super artificial. You can definitely do it on a, on a book. Uh, you can perfectly do it on a movie because you just pan the scene and then you go back and go like, what the hell was that? I don't know. And now I want to know. And, and it's interesting how in trying to tell a story through visuals or, or slides, it doesn't really work that well because then you kill the suspense. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you just kind of hit, hit the nail on the head because the headline of your story is my girlfriend's parents saw me, you know, with my, with my penis in the, in the fridge. There, were, there was no penis being seen. The, the, okay. Everything was being blocked by the, by the freezer. <laughs> okay. That's the key thing. And so you cannot, like you said, you cannot start with that. That has to be the end. It's a so, punch yeah, line, effectively. Yeah, exactly. So what you've done is you flipped it and, and everything that came that, you know, you've, you've given some setup to it by giving that information. And yes, it's not, it, it's, it's not starting the middle of the scene, but that's fine because the middle of the scene is the key point. Yeah. What does work well is to give the moral of the story or a taste of what the moral or the theme of the story is as a way to get into the story. So so you can say you don't have a second chance to make a first impression, but but you can recover from a terrible first impression and then you tell the story. Or I've seen people say sometimes it's, it's the things we don't realize that are where our biggest learnings come from and then you just tell the story. So it's it buys you time for telling a story that is not getting to the point for people that perhaps expect you to get to the point. Uh, but, but no, 100% agree with the way you you use slides. I think that the only concern I think most people would have is if you're not going into the point straight away, that the people watching might feel that you're wasting their time. Now, I think you and I know that they won't feel that if you do it properly, but I think the concern would remain to some people. Yeah, and you have to do it very quickly. You can't, yeah, you can't lag. That's why I like, you know, to the question you had in the beginning about, you know, like the meet Francisco story is you're wasting people's time. You got to move. You got to get people. It, everything has to be engaging and it has to, to be engaging quickly. We haven't talked about this at all yet, but a lot of your book and your work is based on infusing emotion into these presentations because it's a key component of any type of storytelling. If you're not moving people emotionally, then probably you're not moving them at all. And I, I really liked that you had the met metaphor from Jonathan Haidt's book, The Happiness Hypothesis, which is a, a mahout, which is an elephant rider on top of an elephant. So the idea there is obviously that the rider can direct the elephant and the rider is the, you know, the rational part of your brain and the elephant is the emotion. So the, ride, the rider can direct the elephant, but if the elephant decides he's not moving, he's not moving. So if you don't mm -hmm. move the elephant or move people emotionally, it's not going to work. And I, I care about that metaphor a lot because it happened to me. I was in Thailand in 2012, I think, and uh, my wife and I went to one of these elephant places, but it was one of those places that they actually take good care of the elephants. So the only way you could go is you had to stay the whole day. So we would go, we got in early, and they explained to us how it works, and they basically said, you need to feed the elephant and befriend the elephant before you can ride the elephant, because we would be riding. It wouldn't be a mahout, a trained mahout. It would be us. So you feed the elephant and you spend time petting the elephant. And once you've done it enough, they say, okay, fine, now you can ride. And then you stay on top of the elephant. And we didn't have the whole equipment. They just gave us some very basic clues about, like, if you do tap them this way or pull their ear this way, they will kind of move to one side or to the other. I mean, it wasn't great of control we had there. And, uh, and it worked well enough until the point that the elephant got into the water and decided they just wouldn't move until we bathed them. 
And the guy was like, ah, oh, fine. Do you really want, do you want to bathe the elephants? Like, I don't mind. I didn't really want to get into the mud. They're like, well, but the elephant decided he's not moving. So nothing we can do about it. Um, so, yeah. So I think the idea that um, the rational part of your brain is the one that's going to stay in control is one that I've, um, once I saw the metaphor, I immediately related to it because 100%, uh, that is 100% the case. You're not moving that elephant. <laughs> I'm, and I'm definitely going to thank you so much for telling me that because I'm definitely going to add that when I when I present that metaphor. Well, I, um, I, I can I can make it better, and this is something I probably will do when I use this speaking, which is I can give you a photo. That this is a piece of art, so it's a photo of myself and my wife on top of the same elephant, but I'm dressed like a prisoner of war, <laughs> a prisoner of war in a in a cheap romance novel because i have the the prisoner of war outfit kind of open with some chest <laughs> hair showing and, and this picture was printed at the place and uh so printed at the place so it's now kind of aged it looks like a 1960s movie with crap image quality and the the frame i have is made paper made out of elephant dung <laughs> I, i'll send you the picture use it at your own discretion but it's when you might have to apologize before you show it <laughs> oh thank you so much that is that because <laughs> i'm always way too serious when i go into these things so it's like that would be perfect yeah not not a problem i i i have uh, <laughs> yeah, i didn't know that you have to like you have to basically like you have to, they're like kids. You have to, to show them you love them. Do you have to give the elephant chocolate? I, I think it was, what we were giving them? I, I, I don't think it was, might have been vegetables or just some foliage or whatever. Uh, I can't remember exactly what we fed them. They were nice. They're super friendly um, and, and they really enjoyed getting bathed. But, but yeah, you, you, it was very clear you, you weren't in control. There was no question about it. Like you could come, you could fo- kind of like, I mean, like me, you've been married more than once. So, you know, <laughs> you, you can fool yourself, you're in control. But let's be honest here, it, it's not really happening. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. You have to romance that elephant. Yeah. That's the thing is like when you tell people, when you just, when you act in that rational sense, you can make them understand. But in order for people to g- get off their butts and back your initiative and do something, you got to make them believe. And you have to inspire them, and that both of those only come from really moving them emotionally and making them care. And what would you say would be the sort of the the the, the one or two things? Like, if you could only do one or two things to try and move them emotionally with a presentation, what would those things be? I would say show them the people that are going to be most affected by the initiative. So it's either the people that are going to help, or let's say the people that are going to. Um, help achieve or something like that. Give them a person that they can identify with that can become like a hero that they can root for and they can want to help. That's that's really the big thing. Or that's the thing I would do number one. Okay. So essentially having characters or a hero that that they can not necessarily relate to, but but see in real life. And, and I, that is an interesting thing. And, and there's a lot of talk in advertising about avatars, which kind of feels very forced. But what I've seen you do in the book and the supporting videos that go with it, in, I think in one case, the one where it was about uh, diabetes medication, that was an actual person, right? So you, you mm-hmm. guys went and found an actual person that has diabetes, and then it's her telling about her struggles with it and not this, you know, some of our clients find this problem. Exactly, because that's the thing. It's like some of our clients is so abstract that you're never going to to wrap your head around it. So, you know, and Taylor was our, was our diabetic and she is, yeah, she's an absolute real person and she's a wonderful person. And we bring out all the kind of heroic qualities of Taylor and how she wants so much. And what she wants is what we all can take for granted every day. You know, the ability to go to a friend's house without having to drag her diabetes kit with her. And then we, we contrast that with what's holding her back. And that creates this gap between what should be and what is. And we give people an opportunity to solve that that gap and help Taylor just be like the rest of us. And that that's where it becomes so much so powerful because once you like Taylor and you want to help Taylor, then you've got this more it becomes a moral problem that you really, really want to solve. One thing that came to me often as I was going through your stuff was that for all that I'm not lazy for certain things, 
like doing my research for a podcast or reading up and learning more about storytelling, I'm remarkably lazy about things I'm not that comfortable with. And one of them is, for example, video. Which is, which is why every video I ever put out on, on social media is a one-take video of me telling a story because <laughs> I can't be bothered learning how to edit them. And I don't have any doubt that a well-produced video, or not well-produced, but a, a well-chosen video, maybe an interview, maybe a quote, um, what you guys done with, with, with Taylor, that's always going to be very powerful in a presentation. But a lot of people, I think, won't be able to do that. They won't have the budget. They won't have the time. Maybe they just have absolutely no idea of how to do those things. And it's just beyond what a lot of these people would, would ever do for a presentation. But you had a lot of techniques that I thought was super interesting when it came to making slides more like a movie without j just by using the software itself. Um, so can you just talk a bit about two or three of those ways that you can just make them more cinematic, I think it's the word you used. You know, the one one key difference between a movie and and let's say the way that people tell presentations right now is that movies are linear. They you only see one thing at a time. And that makes it so easy for our brains to process. So one of the ways you can emulate that in PowerPoint is to build your slide. Just have one thing show up as you talk about it at a time, instead of just having everything show up at the same time. And that it's it's very simple, but it is actually a cinematic technique. It also does um, a big favor for you because it allows you to be in control of the narrative and in control of, of when people get information. So if you're talking about what's going on in, let's say, the top left corner, no one is going to ask you about what's in the bottom right corner because it's not on the screen yet and they are not going to hijack your presentation. So that's the that's like the easiest way is one thing, just you know, hit the appear button and the one thing at a time pops up on the screen. Let me just illustrate that with a great example you have there with, um, with Puppy Claws. So if I recall correctly, this was... It was about realtors, and it was some data showing that the thing that they should be able to should be talking about in an open house that's going to engage their buyers more than anything else are the holidays and and dogs, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so I think the way you you guys did it was, or you did it was, there was a question, you know, what should you be talking about in an open house to engage buyers or whatever? So that came out first, and then the next click. Uh, it was the statistic that said holidays. Then the next click was the statistic that said dog. And then the last click is this puppy with a Santa Claus hat, you know, puppy claws. That that would be one example of it. You also talked, this is later in the book, perhaps this is the, the more sophisticated techniques, but you talked about things like transitions and, and Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that is the next level is, is using animation and PowerPoint in a way that's going to reinforce your story and visually show your story, not just to be kitschy or, you know, or gimmicky, but to really make it, make it work. And there are a couple that I use all the time. And one of them is called the push transition. And it's really, it comes right from Hollywood where they basically move the camera from, let's say the left to the right. And when they get to the right, it reveals something. Like you see it all the time when you see like the, you know, you see this nothing wall and then the camera pans and then you see the like James Dean smoking a cigarette. So what you do is you have the thing that you reveal on slide, let's say the second slide, and then you have what you're set up on the first slide and you have it, you have it push either from left to right or from bottom to top. And it creates this idea that there's, that whatever is, on the second slide is really off screen and you're pushing it. So let's say you have a statistic that is so dramatically high. You can actually put that statistic on the second slide so that when you're, you're building it, it looks like, boop, boop, boop. you know, you've got your on the, set, the first slide. And then this, this stat is so high, it doesn't even make it on the second slide because you have to push it down in order to get to there. And it's a really, really simple, but dramatic effect. Yeah, and the other one I liked because because this one is not I mean it's not terribly difficult from a technical point of view once you've you've done it once or twice. But the one that I think a lot of people would find very easy to do is when you use a series with the same hero, as you call it. So can you just explain how that works? Yeah. So in that case, what it is is those are um, what we had was we had this 
traditional, quantitative, stat-heavy kind of presentation that was all about, um, I'm going to say it's it's for Capital One, the credit card company, all about getting their merchants like Gap and Best Buy to adopt their rewards card. So what we did was we created a hero for that story and we called her Sophia. And then I ran an ad for a model and I took pictures of Sophia doing the things that the stat said she was going to do. And all we did then was present, let's say, these 15 slides, but instead of just having the big the stat in a chart or something like that, we showed what was going on with Sophia in action at the place, like she's at the Old Navy, she's using her phone to scan the, to scan the item, and then that really brings everybody right to where that stat lives, and it brings it to life, and it just makes it so easy for the people watching it because instead of a bunch of bar charts, which all look exactly the same, now you've got a hero to follow in Sophia. You've got, you see her in all these places and it becomes so much more believable to them because they can see it. And it didn't take a lot of time. It took me about two hours to, to uh, at a mall to shoot all these pictures. And it cost me about $150 to hire this model. And it made it so much more memorable for the stakeholders. Uh, so a couple of other things that on, on content that I wanted to to pick your brain on. Uh, so the first one is the the line "Imagine with, imagine if." Yeah, yeah. So one of the th- things that we're one of the areas where people run into trouble in corporate presentations is when they get to the recommendation section. Often they're afraid to make the big recommendation because they're you know it's it's it might be controversial. It might be you know asking too much, so they're afraid. So they kind of step back and dull it down a little bit, and then they never get what they want. But then they're also, when you recommend something to somebody, then you're, you're really planting your foot in the ground and you're putting yourself at risk, which is why they're scared. And it might backfire on you later on if it doesn't work out. So it, one thing you can do to get around that is to kind of flip it. And instead of saying, I recommend, you say, imagine if, and then you have what you would recommend play out like a, like. In, like I could say, imagine if this podcast was faster rather than this podcast. We recommend this podcast be faster. Say, imagine if it was faster. What? And then you, you show the payoff of what would happen. You end up giving the exact same information with the same message. But the difference is instead of it being a command to people, it's an invitation for them to solve it. It's more of a pull strategy than a push strategy, as exactly. a lot of people like to talk about stories being a pull strategy and not, uh, you know, pushing information onto people. Um, okay, the other one is this very simple concept that I think clears a lot of problems, which is having two versions of the presentation. Yeah, like you know, you asked me this yesterday about you know not in in regard to not showing so much on the screen and not showing so much text. One of the things that people always tell me is they have to do that. There's, there's, they have to provide this information. So my recommendation to them is, or what I say is, imagine if you could give them that, but give it to them at the end and then do two versions of your presentation. Do the long one where you explain everything and it's like a report, but it's a visual report, let's say, and then do a save as, and then your second one, take off all the stuff that doesn't matter or all the stuff, the long version get down to what really, really matters and what will make it easy to see on screen and present that on the wall. And knowing that you're going to give them that long version at the end, then it frees you up and, and you, it makes you realize, I don't have to tell them everything in the 10 minutes I have. They're going to get it, but they're going to get it afterward. In the third one was music, which is something that I think very few people would use or would even consider using when presenting, but, but you swear by it, right? I swear by it, but I think you're absolutely right. It is it is not an easy thing to manage because it's one more thing you have to do in um, addition to your slides, but it is so effective at reaching people emotionally and reaching people, you know, on and keeping things moving. It's the same reason, like if you if you ever watch a movie, the music is really what gives you a lot of information about, you know, telling you when to be scared, telling you when to to love, telling you when to do these things. It's so powerful because like I said, it it gets right to your heart. So I I use it all the time. And there's sometimes what I'll, what I'll do is when I have something pivotal, then I will attach music to my slide and it'll be a sound file that plays and it'll set me up for kind of giving that story sequence. 
and suck people in. But then there are some easy ways to do it, which is, and I know this is going to sound risky, but play music when people walk into your conference room. Play like, I love like stuff that's really positive and universally loved, like, you know, Michael Jackson and stuff like, you know, that, or Motown or things like that, that just refreshes everybody and really shows people when they walk in the room, they're not going to, you know, this isn't going to be like every other presentation I've seen today. This one's going to be a little different. So that, probably not a good idea to have the death metal or the gangster rap right at the start, I guess. Yeah, like I said, yeah, exactly. You got to, unless, unless that's your point, you know, unless you're <laughs> leading them into your world. <laughs> yeah, so but probably not. Um, okay, so one of the things you did in the book that I really liked, but I don't think we're going to have time to go into that in, in that much detail, is at the very end, you say, if you have a month, you can do all of these things. You can do the film, you can do every every resource you, you provide there, you can do. If you have a, a week or two, then probably most of that you can do as well. But could you just give us some ideas? If you have one hour to improve your presentation, or if you have one day, what can you do? Well, if you have one hour, then you do that that exercise we talked about in the beginning is what am, is, is putting yourself in the stakeholder shoes and saying, what do they really need to do with this, this information? What do they, you know, do they need to reformat a product? Do they need to position a brand? Do they just need to give me a green light? That automatically will shift the way that you present it and the way that you decide you, you, you sift your information and then go through your slides and see what you can cut out. And what you really need to focus on, because if you can figure out what, let's say, those three big things are and give those greater emphasis, then you can decide what your stakeholders watching your presentation come away with. That's what I would do in an hour is what's most important, what's really going to help them do what they need to do. And in a day? If you have a day, then I would say actually take that further and then go to the next step, which is when you is to make it certain things real. So those key three scenes figure out how I can visually take my stakeholders into that world and make it real for them, either through like a, a, an image, like a stock photo or a screenshot. Let's say if you're talking about a web page, take a screenshot of the web page so everybody can see what we're talking about and make it easy for them and make it real. Kind of like how we did with the Sophia um, series that I was talking about for Capital One was we just, I took pictures of a, of a millennial at the store doing the thing. I never actually introduced here, Sophia, blah, 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 blah. We just went, brought them right into that scene and it made it real. So now presentations have changed a lot because as we record this, we're in the middle of a pandemic and most of everything is happening indoors. I mean, how have you found that what we're living through now affects it now that the presenting in person is not an option in, in most cases and, and people are glued to the screen? So you, do you find that your style of, of, of presentation, is that helped by the current scenario? Neutral? Hurt in some way? It actually has. Um, it is definitely not helped because what I what I do is 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 based on having a screen behind you that's that's pretty big and pretty dynamic, and using things like video, which is not always easy to pull off in in Zoom. So when I've what I've done is I've simplified everything down and made it so that it can be achievable through Zoom. Interesting because. I think that this type of stuff I do has been horrendously hurt by what we're going through because no one is going to look at me talking for an hour. I don't, whereas I can pull off a keynote without without slides or with just the, you know a handful of slides and some props um, that I cannot do that online. It just doesn't work. And and I would have thought it still might not be working at its full power, but the type of stuff you do would still be better off in many ways because there's a lot of speakers that believe that you need to create a lot of stimulation when people are looking at the screen. So, you know, different sounds, different things to look at the screen. So if it's the same face all the time, you get bored and you switch off. And you might even just go look at something else and just listen to the person. But if there's something new for you to look at every few seconds, it becomes harder to, to switch off. So I think that someone who, like me, who in principle doesn't like massive slide decks, I feel the need for them a lot more now than than I ever did live. Yeah, in that case, it has helped because 
you, like you said, I can create that, that fit and in my style can create that visually stimulating environment and that, that engagement and that presentation that moves the concepts of being simple, being quick, being memorable, all really work really well. Where I've said have had to dial it down is that when, whereas before I tried to be very immersive and tried to create, you know, things like, you know, like using videos and things like that to really, really move the emotions, that's gotten harder on Zoom. So I've had to dial it back and, and, and tell my clients, yeah, let's not do a video here. Let's not put music here. Let's not use this animation because it's going to be, we're not sure how it's going to end up with the bandwidth, but you know, you can absolutely still be visual and create that kind of movie of sorts. Okay. So your book, which I realize now I might not have actually said the name of, uh, is Get to the Heart. And I can hand to heart say that if anything I've ever read or heard made me despise PowerPoint less is been is been your book. Uh, now, how much I'm going to adopt it to its full capacity, it's yet to be seen. But if we stay on on lockdown, I'm pretty sure that that I will end up using a lot of that stuff because I can definitely see how how it should improve not only my presentations but pretty much anyone's. Now, other than the book, which can be found anywhere books are found, where would you want people to go if they want to to get in touch with you or find out more? About about the stuff you're doing these days? Everything's on my website, which is tedfrank.net. And you'll see trailers from my workshops. You'll get to see, um, there's the, the link to the book there and then kind of the whole breakdown. Okay, perfect. Ted, it's been a, an absolute pleasure and uh, and I'm glad we made this happen. Well, thank you. And, you know, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to try what, try opening my freezer and seeing how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves. And until next time. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, I'd love for you to subscribe and leave us a review or a rating on the Apple Podcasts app. It's very easy. You open the app and find this show. Then scroll down a little. And when you see the stars, tap. I'd really appreciate it. And it does help other people find us. And if you'd like to get in touch or find out more about what I do, reach out to me on LinkedIn or visit my website, storypowers.com.